Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to this special episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, today, we will start a series of episodes that focus on philosophies in Southeast Asia and why they matter. For this episode, we will look at philosophy in Thailand. Now, Thailand is the land of the free, and it's the only country in Southeast Asia that has not been colonized by a Western power. It was established as the Kingdom of Siam in 1238 CE, and it's known for its culture, tourist attractions, and of course, its excellent cuisines. But what of its philosophy? What sorts of philosophical ideas are found in Thailand? To, di to discuss philosophy in Thailand, we have my good friend, Saraj Hangbladerom, Professor of Philosophy and the Director of the Center for Science and Technology and Society at Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. Professor Soraj is also the present president of the Philosophy and Religion Society of Thailand. So hello, Professor Soraj. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi, JJ. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> okay, before getting it. Yeah, before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get started in philosophy? Hello? How did you get started in philosophy? Oh, uh, it's a long story. Uh, but, but to make it short, I did not major in philosophy in college at the bachelor's level. I started out studying English language and literature. Uh, so you can hear me well, right? Uh, I started out majoring in English, and mm -hmm. then my minor was in philosophy. Uh, at first, I intended, I thought that I would be teaching English, uh, both language and literature to students. That was my first uh, kind of aspiration at first. And then after I finished college, I went to the US to further my studies for the master's degree in English. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was kind of a, uh, you can call a fortunate turn of event. Uh, my father contacted me and then he told me that there was an opening for a scholarship for a professor in philosophy. So my university, Kuralongkorn, uh, at that time, they offered a scholarship for students to study abroad for the PhD. And the opening at that time was in philosophy, not in English. But my father thought that uh, they were kind of the same or whatever. So <laughs> they, uh, my, my father asked me uh, whether I was interested in applying, uh, sitting for an examination for this scholarship. And then uh, at that time, my father was supporting me uh, for my study in the US and I thought, Oh, that would be a good chance to support myself and, and you know, I uh, didn't have to bother my parents too much. So I said, okay, uh, because my minor in, was in philosophy anyway. And then uh, luckily I got the scholarship. So I went back to Indiana University uh, where I had studied earlier. And then I applied for a change of major. It was possible to do that in the US is still not possible to do that in, in Thailand. You have to resign and then reapply to, in order to change your major, mm -hmm. but it was possible. So I transferred all my credits that I had studied in English to the philosophy program. So uh, it was not like I was interested in philosophy so much from the beginning that I intended to be a professional in philosophy from the beginning. Mm -hmm. No, but but there was something that well, you know I did not intend, and something uh, fortuitous, so to speak, that happened. However, it does not mean that I uh, did not have any interest at all in philosophy. Uh, I, as I told you, I minored in philosophy, but in high school I was also interested in philosophy together with literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read some of the books which were available in Thai language at that time. Not very many of them, but I got hold of some of them. And then I became interested also in philosophy. So the two subjects kind of uh, 
intertwined and and they still do uh even right now i am still teaching a course in philosophy and literature okay things. so yeah. who, who influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy who who influenced you oh many uh <laughs> When I was a high school student, I read something about Plato, and I think uh, this was through to many, many people who became professors or became uh, interested in philosophy afterwards. And I was hooked by the, uh, you know, theory of forms. And I actually believe, you know, believe it or not, at that time, I, I still remember uh, when I was in high school, a uh, teenager, I actually believed that uh, there was such a heaven, and the heaven was populated by the forms, like you know, form of white, form of uh, black, and so on. And I actually believed that, and I, you know, kind of uh, uh, thought that uh, the world that people live in, and uh, in which people perceive and and do business was not the real world and the real world was in the heavens you know as, as plato described i started to change my mind about this uh, not very long after i started teaching mm -hmm. in the university after i finished my phd and i thought that oh this is just you know a kind of a fairy tale or something but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but but uh, uh, I cannot deny that Plato was one of the most influential figures in my development. So was Immanuel Kant because I wrote my PhD dissertation about Kant's mm -hmm. theory of imagination, which is a key concept in the critique of theorism in his mm -hmm. epistemology. Right. Okay, so now on to our main topic. So could you give us an overview, a brief overview of Thailand, its history, culture, religion, and intellectual heritage? Yeah, uh, this topic alone can take like, you know, a whole course, you know, a whole semester. <laughs> mm. But to make a long story short, uh, the culture was, uh, has been, <coughs> I'm sorry, influenced quite a lot, very significantly by Indian culture. So the language, many of the words are borrowed from Pali and Sanskrit, which are the uh, main languages in India. Uh, Pali is the main language of Buddhism and Sanskrit is the main cultural uh, high society language, uh, Brahmin language from India. So the culture was influenced uh, quite a lot by Indian culture. So uh, the the art and the especially Buddhism, uh, the intellectual tradition, uh, the worldview, and you know many such things uh, were have been heavily influenced by India, and there is also influence from China because Thai people according to the most recent kind of uh, archaeological and ethnographic research originated from the south of China. And they migrated downwards uh, because uh, during the, as you said, during the 13th century, the Mongol came to China mm. and they defeated the, the Chinese dynasty of the, of the Song. And then they established their own dynasty, they ruled all of China. And uh, due to that pressure, Thai people migrated southward from the south of China, from, from the provinces of Yunnan. And, and uh, uh, there is a province, uh, Quang, Quang Zhou, Quang, Quang, Quang Tong, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the province uh, which is uh, beyond Hong Kong right now. Uh, was populated mostly by Thai people, but they migrated downwards. So they came to the area where they live today that you that we can see on mm. the map. Uh, the area 
had already been populated by other people, especially the Khmer and the Mon. So they uh, mixed together quite a lot. And there were a lot of exchanges in many ways. And we borrowed many words from, from Khmer also because they had a, a very advanced civilization at that time. So, uh, and then uh, the Thai people managed to drive off the, the Khmer and the Mons, and uh, they were successful at setting, uh, establishing their own kingdoms. And those kingdoms developed into the modern nation state of Siam uh, that you see on the map. And the country's name was changed to Thailand during World War II, I think in 1942, because at that time, there was a kind of a movement of uh, ethno-nationalism. Uh, the land uh, that you see on the map belong to the Thai people. So uh, we should not call the country Siam because Siam refers to the land, not mm -hmm. the people. Okay. As, as far as I was told, you know, in history lessons. So in order to emphasize the fact that this land belonged to our people, to, to us, yeah, uh, the government decided to change the name of the country to Thailand. So it, it reflects kind of the uh, nationalistic uh, mindset that were uh, prevalent at that time. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, uh, the, the uh, beginning of World War II, and at that time, World War II was uh, still being uh, fought all over the world, as, as we know. So, uh, and then after, oh, by the way, uh, the country became an ally of the Japanese. I, I don't know if you had already known about this mm -hmm. during World War II because Japan came and they would like to attack Singapore and Malaya, uh, Malaysia nowadays was called Malaya uh, at that time via Thailand. So, so they would like to come from the north of Malaysia, Mal Mal Malaya uh, down to Singapore. Mm -hmm. And they asked the Thai government uh, for a permission for them to pass through uh, the, the land in the south of the country. The government, uh, the people themselves fought the Japanese for a few hours because, you know, they suddenly appeared on the beaches and they tried to invade the people. And then there was a negotiation between uh, the Thai government and the Japanese government. And the Thai government just, you know, they, they didn't want to fight. Even though the people wanted to fight, the government did not. So they signed a deal and they decided to become an ally of the Japanese. And they you know, had a big ceremony uh, signing uh, you know, treaty of friendship and so on. However, in the end, at the end of World War II, uh, after the Japanese surrendered, there was a change in government in Thailand. And the new government did not recognize the declaration of war that the previous government declared. So they declared, the new government said that uh, the previous government did all this under duress, under, you know, they, they, was, they were forced to do so by the Japanese. So the uh, treaty of friendship with Japan and the declaration of war against the allies, the US and the UK became null and void. Uh, and uh, the US bought this. I mean, uh, they, they accepted uh, <laughs> our, uh, this government's version. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK did not, but the, U the UK had to listen to the US anyway. Mm -hmm. So we were not treated as a defeated country after World War II mm -hmm. because of this uh, incident. And the Japanese did not like this quite a bit. So we, uh, they thought that, you know, we were kind of, you know, uh, being too diplomatic, uh, you know, we uh, uh, were 
uh, very good at finding a way not to um, become a defeated nation. Mm. Thing. And after World War II, things uh, became quite normal. So we developed and there, there were a lot of uh, national development plans and then things, uh, uh, especially the economy got, you know, mm. quite, quite advanced more, you know, at least more advanced than uh, at the beginning or at the end of World War II. So basically that is the story. Look, sorry, Dan. <laughs> okay, yeah. but what is it like being a philosopher in Thailand? How many universities offer philosophy courses? How many professional philosophers do you have? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, as of now, uh, philosophy is kind of being threatened, I, I could say that, uh, by many factors, uh, one of which is the movement of uh, neoliberalistic thinking that uh, is sweeping all over the world. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure in the Philippines also. Uh, the universities, instead of regarding themselves as, you know, the repository of thinking and knowledge and wisdom, they start to think of themselves as corporations. <laughs> and, uh, that's true, uh, especially here. Uh, they start to think of themselves as, you know, enterprises, business enterprises. So they have to uh, do their own accounting and, you know, uh, expenses and income and they have to report uh, how, how much they make or how much they, they lose in a year mm -hmm. to the governing body of the university. We call them the university council. I think you might call them differently. Uh, the, the highest governing body of the university. And this has put pressure on philosophy because according to the administrators, philosophy does not make money. <laughs> and, we have and, the same problem and it, it seems to continue to uh, spend money because you know uh, the university has to pay for professors mm -hmm. and so on and uh, this has resulted in uh, for Jula for Jula for my university is still okay I mean we are still here the department is still here the programs are still here but for other universities, especially the smaller ones in the countryside, they are having a hard time because uh, philosophy departments have been kind of dissolved and uh, lumped together with other departments, for example, literature and history and psychology mm -hmm. and whatnot. So they uh, were put together under the same department, same uh, organizational unit in order to save costs. And many programs have been kind of shut down. Uh, so uh, the, the association, uh, as you mentioned, I am uh, president of the PARST, uh, the main philosophy association in the country. We uh, have listened to our colleagues uh, talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we are looking for ways to kind of promote philosophy among the public. So uh, that could be a bright spot if you think of it, because uh, due to the pressures that I have talked about, Many teachers in philosophy, including many students in philosophy, you know, it's a very encouraging sign. They are trying to bring philosophy out of the academia, out of the university, mm -hmm. and they try to start movements of, you know, discussion, debates, uh, talks about philosophy in philosophy uh, through the social media and through kind of the 
various venues of meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, is, for example, in coffee shops and, and uh, things like that, and they advertise their activities through like Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, many groups are uh, opening up YouTube channels where they talk about the content. I mean, the content is quite good, uh, interactive yeah. philosophy. And this is mostly done by students. Okay, that's interesting. Is, as encouraging the professors kind of, you know, they are more quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. but what, what sort of philosophy can be found in Thailand? What significant philosophical ideas have Thai philosophers offered? Yeah, most of us uh, would like to compare Buddhism and other aspects in Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. So this is because Buddhism is professed by 95% uh, of the people, 94 to 95% of the people. The rest are uh, Christians, Muslims, and, and a very small number of Hindus and Sikhs. So uh, if you talk about the uh, most uh, outstanding characteristic of, you know, it's, it's a controversial uh, mm -hmm. matter whether there is such a thing as Thai philosophy. I wrote a paper about this. Uh, as you see on screen. Uh, mm -hmm. The title is How is Thai Philosophy Possible? So I bypassed uh, the question of whether there is Thai philosophy. And I titled the paper How Thai Philosophy is Possible. And I say, you know, put out the, the conditions of possibility for there being Thai philosophy. And it's characterized uh if you talk about the content by buddhism but not only buddhism otherwise thai philosophy would be indistinguishable uh, from buddhist philosophy and thus it would lose its identity so there has to be uh such a thing as thai philosophy but it's kind of uh, controversial or uh fluid as as you said so on the one hand thai philosophy could be regarded as whatever philosophy done by Thai people. And, and uh, you know, not only uh, myself are uh, talking like that, uh, we can certainly talk about like Polish philosophy. Because, you know, there's, there's certainly philosophy in Poland, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is Polish philosophy, and you have to interpret what it really means uh, by talking about Polish philosophy. We, we know about German philosophy, of course, it's a very uh, large, very strong tradition in Western philosophy, so it's French philosophy. <laughs> so perhaps in the same vein, we can talk about Thai philosophy, only that the number, <coughs> I'm sorry, only that the number of people working in philosophy in Thailand uh, is very small, especially when compared with those in Germany. And this is something that I uh, am thinking about because if you look at the number of population, uh, Thailand has about 66 million. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, a bit more than the population of France and a bit less than the population of Germany. However, there, uh, there are numerous, you know, very many philosophical associations in Germany, a lot of them, and um, much more people uh, in philosophy in Germany and France, in each country, than uh, people working in philosophy in Thailand. So the, the big question is, is how that is the case. And uh, in order to be able to answer this question, it, it will help us a lot when we think about how to develop the infrastructure of education and research, not only in philosophy, but uh, when, we, when we talk about the works of the university and research. 
institutes as a whole and the academic life as part of culture. Mm -hmm. So what do the rest of the Thai people do? I mean, uh, the members of the PAIST of the uh, Thai Philosophy Association is only 150. <laughs> and, we are the main, and we are the main organization of philosophy in the country. Uh, there are so many, I don't know how many, but much more uh, associations in Germany, each of which I think has more than 150 or 200. I mean, yeah, mm. a and a lot of, a lot more people are working in philosophy, teaching, uh, studying in Germany and France than in Thailand. So what, what are Thai people doing? I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the number of farmers are dwindling. I mean, it's not like in the past because uh, we can use the technologies and so on. So this is a big problem that, uh, you know, could be a research proposal to my government. Yeah. yeah, so, but what are some unique features or salient features of Thai philosophy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see on the slide that uh, I put a uh, connection to with Buddhism. And, and as I have said, this is, uh, well, uh, there is a kind of Buddhism in Thailand, which is rather unique. And, and, and people call it Thai Buddhism. And it, it, it is very much connected with uh, the, the peculiar aspects of Thai culture. So in that sense, uh, we might be able to call it uh, a unique feature of Thai philosophy. Mm -hmm. So it's imbued with Buddhism, but it's not the same kind of Buddhism that you have in India or Sri Lanka or Burma. Mm -hmm. It's unique to Thailand. In what way? Uh, that is rather hard to say. It is kind of, uh, it's, it's, it, it has more to do with how the thinking is done and how uh, many of my colleagues are, uh, are working. Uh, what I have in mind is that uh, the last point on the screen, uh, they tend to be parochial. And this can be a negative aspect because you know philosophy is the same as other academic disciplines. We have to get in touch with one another. Otherwise, we may think that we are the best. But uh, some of my colleagues, not all, not all, uh, I have to emphasize this, but some of my colleagues, they don't know much English. Mm -hmm. And their horizon is kind of limited uh, because uh, when they write any research work, 90%, 80% at least of their cited works are in Thai language. And, and you know, uh, as I said earlier, the whole scene of Thai philosophy or philosophy in Thailand is not so large to begin with. Mm -hmm. So the number of literature <coughs> in philosophy in Thai language is very limited. And these people, my colleagues, uh, a portion of them, do not cite uh, English literature. So, so uh, it's, it's uh, something that can be improved later on. And this is tied up with uh, the uh, proposal to improve or to expand the infrastructure of research and teaching mm -hmm. uh, academic atmosphere in general. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, so where, where do you think is philosophy in Thailand heading in the near future? Yeah, very good point. Uh, and you can see on, on the screen here, uh, more openness and, and I'm not saying this as a wish, I am reporting a, a changing fact of fact. Uh, there has been more openness, especially among the students. Now, excuse me.
in what way? Uh, the culture itself is opening up. Uh, instead of confining oneself as my colleagues are doing, as I said earlier, the younger generations of philosophy students and uh, students in general are trying to, to break through. And this is, you know, can be a literal meaning to break through the, the, uh, the lid, uh, whatever that encloses uh, the uh, space of Thai culture that has been there for, for a long, long time. So they are trying to find a breakthrough and you can see uh, this struggle for breakthroughs in the various protest movements. And I am sure that you have come across uh, news reports of what is happening in Thailand yeah, right yeah. now, a lot of protests, right? Has been so far many years but this year is special in that uh, the students have joined the protests mm -hmm. and we are not talking about only university students we are talking about high school students or even middle school students i mean that's interesting 13, 14 year olds and uh, they come to the uh, protest and they join the protesters mm -hmm. and they are creating a lot of uh, disruptions in their schools they are you know uh, talking out loud to their teachers uh, arguing with their teachers this is a no no has been a no -no when i was young it's unthinkable to argue with your teacher whatever the teacher tells you uh, you have to accept it but but uh, not so for this generation of students so it, it can be a good sign for including mm. you know for philosophy and other subjects uh, as a whole. And the future is also very much connected with globalization of higher education. What I mean is that, uh, well, for philosophy, it means that uh, more or I think there should be more. I mean, I'm, I'm putting my uh, wish into what I am reporting. Uh, there should be more uh, professors and students uh, presenting their findings, their research works in English to international audience. So, and uh, there are two factors, uh, one of which is uh, the pressure from the administration, as I have said, and the other direction is from the uh, from the the internal logic of uh, academic work in the country itself. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean is that uh, in order to excel, in order to become excellent at what you are doing, you cannot just uh, limit yourself to Thai language, uh, writing and reading. And, and citing, you have to opening, you have to open yourself up. Uh, and more people realize that and then they try to improve themselves. So they try to become more globalized. So influence of neoliberalism. And we have talked about philosophy being squeezed out and you know, uh, there is a profound demographic change. I don't know about the Philippines, but in Thailand, more, no, fewer, fewer children are being born. No. So as a result, uh, because of the demographic change, the shape of the population is like this, uh, where people at my generation, 40 and 50 years old, uh, represent the largest percentage mm -hmm. of population. And then, uh, population of Thailand from zero to 10 year old, like 70% uh, of people 50 or 60 years old. So uh, a lot of uh, gap between the 
uh, younger generations, much fewer of them when compared to people of my age. So as a result, uh, fewer students apply to the primary schools and the secondary schools. And many schools have found a hard time looking for students and uh, they, have, they have to close. Mm -hmm. And this has already affected the university. So uh, in the past, when I was a student, there were more students than seats, <laughs> available seats in the university in the country. But right now there are more seats than students. <laughs> than students, yes, yes, yes. So students can choose. Mm -hmm. And they choose to go to more prestigious schools. So my university, as of now, is still doing quite okay. But the smaller ones in the countryside are struggling. Mm -hmm. Used to accept 100 students, you know, in, in, the, in their program. But right now uh, they have to do with like, 15 or 20 students only. <laughs> but, but the program is designed to accommodate 100 students uh, each year. So you can see the picture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a result of this, there has been a movement, you know, conscious movement. And, and I think uh, including a kind of spontaneous movement of bringing, taking, taking philosophy out of the academia, as I have said. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the future, we can see something like, uh, how, how I could, how should I put it? Less professional philosophy, because when you talk about professional philosophy, you talk about philosophers who are already professors, mm -hmm. who, who receive their salary and uh, whose uh, working life consists in teaching and, and doing research. But it is possible, and, and you know, it is uh, the movement is still on right now. For, uh, and, and this can, you know, I don't know about quality control or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, people, people in general are really interested in philosophy. I mean, the general public. Uh, they write to me uh, to my Facebook inbox uh, uh, channel mm -hmm. asking all sky all sorts of questions in philosophy you know basic questions but they have not been trained in philosophy they want to know about philosophy and they uh, have been reading a lot of books and they ask me what books should I read and so on Mm -hmm. So this is part of the future of, of philosophy in Thailand. Uh, less professional, more philosophy on social media, including Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Mm -hmm. More spontaneous groupings, like, you know, uh, if I want to start a group, I can just uh, opening up, open up a page on Facebook and, and attract uh, members. So uh, things like this are, are growing in in my country, mm -hmm. and not only in philosophy but in other areas, history, literature, and all kinds of things. And there are uh, there are more people who are interested in philosophy. But as for the PhD program, I think uh, they are still there. Mm -hmm. I don't think the administrator at my university are going to close down the PhD program in philosophy here at Jula. Would be an embarrassment to the outside world. Uh, they, they won't do that for the time being. So <laughs> the formal part, the professional part, will still be around for a foreseeable amount of time. But what we are experiencing is this kind of... Uh, flowering spontaneous movement of uh, philosophical activities you know talking arguing discussing mm -hmm. outside of the academy yeah. okay speaking of your professional life 
What's your advice for those who want to get into professional philosophy, especially people there in Thailand? Yeah, and, and uh, I have thought about this and you can see here right, quite a lot. Uh, this is mostly for students, like graduate students in philosophy, but, but I think it can be applied to students in other fields also, including members of the public. But, but the number one is be realistic. I mean, uh, having said all this, uh, you can see the picture of, you know, if you want a job as a philosophy professor in Thailand, I have to be realistic. And I have to tell you that things do not look good okay. at the moment, unless you want to be your own YouTuber and open up your own YouTube channel in philosophy <laughs> podcast channel, then it's up to you. Right? You, you mm. are responsible for yourself. But if you want to work in a university, it's still possible. It's still possible. I have to emphasize that. It's not that everything is closed up, but uh, it's not as easy as perhaps uh, 20 or 30 years ago. You have to be really good. If you are good enough, then you can uh, get a job. No problem about that. So if you, uh, you have to search yourself and after searching, if you find out that you are born, I mean, some people do like myself, you know, uh, if you search yourself and you find out that I know, I know I am born to be a professor. So if you, if you are that confident, then go for it. Uh, because, you know, studying for the PhD and looking for a job and, and whatnot takes time and effort. And, you know, uh, a lot of uh, patience. So uh, you have to be realistic about that. But as I said, uh, it's not that everything is bleak and then there, there is no opening. There are openings, but um, they are only for those who are really, really determined. So pick one area where you can excel. And this is very important. This is very important. I have told you that my dissertation was on Kant's epistemology, a very small aspect in a very uh, few pages of the critique of peer reason, just you know, a small number of pages. And then I wrote 270 pages. <laughs> commenting on uh, like three or four pages in the critique of peer reason. Very, very kind of narrow. Uh, my point is this, uh, as for myself, when I finished my PhD and started working in Thailand, at that time there, there was no internet. It was in the early years of the 1990s. The internet was just being uh, started. And I could not get the books and articles that I needed in order to continue my research on Kant's epistemology. So I, I was at a loss. I mean, I did not want to abandon my research, but uh, there were a lot of pressures, uh, duties, assignments uh, from my uh, senior professors. They asked me to teach those and uh, this and that. So I, I had to change my area of research. Otherwise, it was not possible at that time to continue to write papers on Kant's epistemology. And I was lucky in a way in that I came to know colleagues in other areas. A colleague in the faculty of medicine came to me and we kind of got along with each other and he invited me to join his, his research circle in bio and medical ethics. Mm -hmm. And that is my first foray into applied fields of philosophy. So from then on, it was kind of you know, no looking back. You know, I, uh, I still regard myself as a Khan scholar, as so, but you know, I, I still want to do that. Uh, but 
uh, from that moment on, a few years after I started teaching. I almost all everything that I wrote and did research was on applied areas in philosophy, medical ethics, bioethics, and, and then information ethics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and then uh, my background in Kant's epistemology and in uh, ethical theories in Kant and in uh, the ancient Greeks helped a lot in, uh, you know, helping my colleagues in art of view. So that is one, one area that philosophers can do to contribute to kind of more interdisciplinary collaboration with colleagues in other areas. So my advice would be that if you are a graduate student in philosophy, it, it would not hurt if you come and attend uh, meetings, conferences in other fields, such as you know, sociology uh -huh. or even medicine, when they talk about those things that are not technical, like you know, social and ethical implications of whatever they do. You you can you know, as philosophers, uh, you you have the uh, necessary vocabulary anyway. So that is my suggestion. So go to conferences, make yourself known. Uh, that's important. Uh, to make yourself known is very important uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, you can like, you know, uh, when you apply for a job, oh, oh uh, uh, I have heard of this name before. I have come across one of his papers here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good. So submit papers to journals, of course, you know, and write book proposals, you have to aim high. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's not a, a, an easy task writing a book, but uh, philosophers still, many of them anyway, they still prefer books mm -hmm. rather than journals, uh, articles in journals. For them, uh, you can spend like one week or two weeks. I mean, some philosophers, some more traditional people, they think like that. Uh, it's not a big deal, but if you have a book, you know, a whole volume, uh, monograph, monograph, I mean, single author book, oh, it's, it's a big deal and you, you can count quite a bit. Uh, okay. A yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a career worth it? It's a career in philosophy worth it? Hmm? It's a career in academic philosophy worth it? Suck it, suck, I'm sorry. Didn't it's the it. career in academic philosophy worth it? Doctor? In, it's the career, your professional okay. career. Oh, Profe oh, oh. Yeah. oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, is the career in philosophy worth it? Yes, of course, yes, 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 yes. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I am coming to, uh, uh, retirement. I mean, uh, I'm coming to the period of time in my life when I have to consider my retirement because everybody at Chulalongkorn has to retire at 60 and I am 58. So I have two more years left working here. And I don't know what I will do I know that I will have to do something because I still can, but I don't know what because <laughs> uh, the university, the dean has told me clearly that he has no money to hire me uh, after I am 60 years old in two years time. Mm -hmm. Because uh, according to the rules of my university, uh, before I'm 60, the university gets money from the government. But after I, after I am 60, the government won't, won't give money to the university to hire me. And if the university wants to hire me further, they have to find their own money. And the dean said to me, uh, he doesn't have money. So uh, <laughs> it, it's good, it's good uh, in a way. Uh, can be can be heartbreaking if you know uh, they don't see my significance but I, I i don't think of it that way i think that uh, it 
provides me with an opportunity, uh, an open space mm -hmm. where I can uh, decide for myself what to do after I'm 60. So yes, it, it's worth it. It's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the freedom as university professor to do whatever you want to do. I mean, uh, I mean, if you look at other careers, like you know, working in the, in the business or industry, there you don't have the freedom. You don't have uh, the time, the block of time for three or four, two or three months during the summer where you don't have to teach, mm -hmm. and you have the block of time needed to write a book, uh, write a proposal, or finish the book, or do whatever that you would like to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, it's very satisfying. So what I said there is that only if you are fully committed to it, because if you don't like to have free time and thinking about what to write or what to read, then you know <laughs> that's not uh, worth. This is much. not the life for you. No. no. <laughs> okay, so. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll just entertain some questions from our audience. Okay, so one question. In the Philippines, philosophy of the human person is taught in values education subjects in elementary and high school. Does the Thai government give opportunities like this for philosophers? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, there is no philosophy teaching at the high school level. And that is a big problem mm -hmm. because it has been recognized uh, in many places by many, many circles that uh, philosophy education at the high school level and, and even at the primary school level can be very good for the students. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is very good when uh, you want to develop uh, the critical thinking skills in the students. And most importantly, uh, philosophy, and, and I love to talk about this, philosophy uh, talks about non-existent things. Mm -hmm. And I, I can think of no other academic disciplines where they love to talk about non-existent things. You talk about this to a historian, he says, nonsense, you know. <laughs> history, history must be about the, the truth, the fact, what, what has already happened. Mm. No, no, you know. Uh, we, we would like to talk about counterfactuals, what mm. could have happened, but <laughs> has not. So uh, it, it's fascinating to uh, give students, especially high school and primary school students, the opportunity to think about what could have happened. Mm -hmm. What could have happened uh, if such and such figure in history uh, did not do what, what they did, but they did. Uh, what if they had done something else? Mm -hmm. What have happened? Uh, what would have happened if? Historians don't like to talk about that. Uh, they say it's nonsense, waste of time, but no, it's not a waste of time. It's very useful and yep. uh, can exercise the imagination and everything. So this is one thing that philosophy can help a lot mm -hmm. in in high school. And uh, critical thinking, of course, you know, you don't accept anything unless you have adequate Good reasons. Arguments. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, here, here's another question. So if someone who wanted to read or undertake Thai philosophy, what are the books you can recommend for us to read? Uh, this is a difficult question because <laughs> Thai people in general, and this is, you know, I have to admit this, are not that good in English. Mm -hmm. uh, it's due to several factors. One of which is that uh, is, is uh, what you have already mentioned. Uh, we as a people, as a nation, have not had much exposure to foreigners. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a quirk in history that happened to us. Uh, only uh, those 
who have the job of dealing with foreigners like those working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, diplomats, or you know, those who work in import and export who, or who work with tourists have any exposure to foreigners. But Thai people in general, I mean, most of them, they don't need to interact with foreigners or to talk in English or to write or read anything in English in order to get ahead in their career. So uh, that is why English is not prevalent. The reason I'm saying this is that if uh, you, I mean, from outside of Thailand, want to study Thai philosophy, there are some literature in English, mostly uh, done by sociologists and anthropologists. Mm -hmm. They study Thai culture and historians, they, they write quite a bit about Thai history, but that is not the same as, philo as philosophy. Mm -hmm. You can go to uh, the literature in Buddhist philosophy, but that is more general Buddhist philosophy. Not, not particularly, you know, the Thai version of mm -hmm. philosophy, of Buddhist philosophy. Right. Uh, there are a few scholars, international scholars, for example, Donald Swearer at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. He's a scholar of Thai Buddhism and not many in the world who are like him. So if you want to start out, you can go to Swearer's works, Donald Swearer's. Uh, you can search uh, using keywords Thai Buddhism. Uh, and then I think uh, the bibliography, you can find Don Swearer's works. So that can be a starting point. But if you want to get serious into studying Thai culture or Thai philosophy, you have to study, start to study Thai language. <laughs> Before you get into the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, here's the last question. So from our friend, Joseph Martin Jose. Don't you think that looking for a unique flavor of a philosophy like the Thainess or the Filipino-ness of a philosophy is detrimental to the activity of philosophizing itself? Do you see any problems with such focus? Is it not more fruitful for philosophers to just do philosophy instead? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. And this is the question I grappled with in my paper, the paper was more than 20 years old, the paper on how is Thai philosophy possible. I think you can search for it on Google, just, just type the title of the paper, how is Thai philosophy possible? And I discussed this very problem, this pull into opposite directions between philosophy in Thailand on the one hand and Thai philosophy on the other hand. <laughs> Philosophy in Thailand means uh, philosophy done in Thailand, in Thai universities, mm -hmm. by Thai people. And the content doesn't have to be uniquely Thai, right? So you can study Kant or Hegel or Quine or Davidson in Thai universities. And in fact, uh, these people are being studied in Thai universities. So if you would like to know about the level of achievement of uh, Thai university professors who study the works of Donald Davidson, for example. Mm. Yes, yeah, you know, it's, uh, they are there. And then some of my colleagues at my department are in analytic philosophy and, and she uh, is doing works on, on uh, philosophy of language. So she has done works on da Davidson, Quine, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm. So, but, but she is Thai, so that's philosophy in Thailand. Uh, yeah. Whereas Thai philosophy is something unique that you uh, ask about, uh, where the content cannot be found anywhere else. Uh, in the paper, I uh, argued that uh, the one collapsed into the other. By that, I mean Thai philosophy kind of collapses into philosophy in Thailand. Mm -hmm. You cannot find, because this is the matter of principle, of logical principle, because philosophy after all 
uh, searches for the truth the same way as mathematics search for mathematical truth so philosophy searches for philosophical truth whatever it is just, just uh, suppose it uh, there is such a thing so the search for philosophical truth cannot be limited to any particular culture mm -hmm. otherwise we have different kinds of truth which is self-defeating you know in, uh, self-contradictory so in the end it collapses but uh, having said that it does not mean that uh, the unique characteristics are not very are not important it can be important especially if you want to know the sociological condition mm -hmm. uh, we have spent i mean most of the time we have discussed here in this episode uh, we have been talking about the sociological condition of philosophy in thailand uh, yes it's, it's a viable field of study but uh, it's not the same as the content the very content the very search for uh, answers to the universal questions in philosophy like what is truth or what is reality mm -hmm. yeah. okay so on that note thanks again professor Soraj, for sharing your time with us for you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. <laughs>